During my first summer at university, I spent a couple of weeks working at a cat conservation centre just outside London called the Cat Survival Trust. I arrived late one night, tired after a long journey, and they put me in a caravan next to one of the snow leopard enclosures. Exhausted after a long journey, I went straight to sleep. Until about 4.30 or 5 the next morning, I was wakened by this tremendous racket coming from the snow leopard enclosure. I looked out my caravan window and there were the pair of snow leopards racing around the enclosure up the sides of the three-dimensional space in and over and under all of the different wooden climbing frames that existed in their enclosure. And I was struck just by the, the speed and agility and power and also reminded that they were active at dawn because they're crepuscular by nature. And later that day I was set to work cleaning out the sleeping accommodation of the snow leopards which in contrast to their large outdoor enclosure was quite a small den-like space filled with wood shavings to absorb the urine of the cats which as a carnivore species in a lot of eating a lot of meat is quite strong and pungent and more full of ammonia and urea than human urine. And I noticed that because as I stepped into the space to start cleaning it out, my eyes immediately started streaming with tears and my lungs and nostrils were filled with the acrid smell of ammonia. And in the end, the only way to clean out the space was to close your eyes, hold your breath, shovel a few shovelfuls of bedding out and then emerge into the sunlight gasping for air. For me, it was a very vivid introduction to the science of the mountain ghost and to the science of snow leopards. Snow leopards hunt incredibly agile prey species, mostly wild sheep and goats, in some of the steepest terrain and roughest terrain in the world. So they have to be incredibly fast and agile and powerful to chase those agile prey species literally up and down the sides of mountains. They also tend to be active at dawn and dusk, crepuscular because in the half-light of dusk and dawn, their best place to take advantage of their prey species, lesser eyesight, and sneak up on them and get as close as they can. And lastly, living in those mountainous environments where they rarely encounter another snow leopard, being able to leave strong smelling scent signals is a way for snow leopards to keep in touch with each other, to advertise and communicate information, things like habitat and, and territory, as well as reproductive status. That was my first and most vivid introduction to the science of snow leopards, and it was the beginning of a journey that has taken me from there to doing a PhD in snow leopard conservation in Nepal, and onwards to now assisting the work of the Snow Leopard Conservancy as an associate. And it's a story that tonight on the International Day of the Snow Leopard that we're going to share together as we explore the science of the mountain ghost and the science of snow leopards. And we're going to do that in four parts. We're going to first look at the science of snow leopards themselves and how this big cat is superbly attuned to its harsh mountain environment. Secondly, we're going to look at the science of snow leopard conservation, some of the different natural science tools that snow leopard conservationists use to understand and quantify the populations of snow leopards, of their prey, and of their habitat. Thirdly, we're going to look at the science of snow leopard coexistence, particularly the importance of social science in understanding how people and snow leopards can coexist, including the threats that human activities pose to the species, as well as some of the innovative solutions at both the grassroots and the geopolitical level. And lastly, we're going to look at the science of snow leopard landscapes and how both culturally and physically these landscapes provide many, many different things that we need, both for local communities living alongside snow leopards, but also for the rest of us living downstream or indeed on the other side of the world. And as we go on this journey together and explore the science of the mountain ghost and the science of snow leopards. What I hope you discover, as I have, is that in our interconnected world with its interconnected challenges and also its interconnected solutions, that the science of snow leopards, the science of the mountain ghost, is in fact the science of us all.
The best place in the world to see snow leopards in the wild is in Hemis National Park in northwest India. Needless to say, in the two times that I've been there, I didn't see any snow leopards. The second time I was there to see an innovative ecotourism project called Himalayan Homestays, run by the Snow Leopard Conservancy India Trust. But the first time I was there, I was there to climb Stokangri, a 6,000 meter or 20,000 foot non-technical Himalayan peak. And to climb Stokangri, there were a number of bits of kit and equipment that me and my friends had to use in order to adapt safely to climb that mountain. The first thing we had to do, given that it was high altitude and cold, was that we had to dress up warmly in warm gear that would keep us warm in the snow and in the ice. The second thing we had to do when we were climbing the snow and ice fields and to give us grip on the rocks and the glaciers that we crossed was to use ice axes and crampons attached to our boots. And lastly, although we didn't use it on this particular peak for those mountaineers who go higher, especially over 8,000 meters, they often used bottled oxygen, just like this one, in order to give them the best chance of getting to the summit so that they can get max maximum oxygen into their tired muscles in the thin air of high altitude. In essence, when we ventured into Stock Angry and climbed it, whenever any mountaineer goes into a high mountain ecosystem or even to a, the summit of a mountain, with our puny human adaptations, we need to adapt to that environment and we use kit and science and technology to allow us to safely enter that mountain environment. In a sense, in doing so, we become like a snow leopard. Snow leopards, of course, are uniquely adapted through natural selection to have all of this kit already in place. Just like my jacket, they have the thickest and densest fur of any of the big cats, up to 10 centimeters thick in places. Just like my crampons and ice axes, they have broad fur-lined feet that function as snowshoes so they don't sink into heavy snow, but also claws for extra traction when climbing or particularly when they're catching their very agile prey. And lastly, living and hunting and moving around in high altitude regions, they have an enhanced respiratory capacity that like bottled oxygen for high altitude mountaineers means they can get maximum oxygen into their bloodstream and to their muscles to enable them to function to the best of their capacity as agile hunters and big cats. Add to that some of the science of snow leopards that I experienced at the Cat Survival Trust, the ability of snow leopards to scent mark and leave uh, sensory markers for other snow leopards around their habitat, as well as that phenomenal power and agility to move across very difficult terrain, means that snow leopards are perfectly attuned to their harsh mountain environment. In that sense, the science of snow leopards is really a science of adaptation. Snow leopards occur across a vast area of Central Asia, up to 2 million square kilometers. That's up to eight times the size of the UK, covering 12 different nations and in terrain that covers many, many different mountain ranges, many of them very steep, including the highest peaks in the world. And so finding snow leopards, knowing how many they are, where they are, their behavior, is an inherent challenge to snow leopard conservation. But snow leopard conservationists over the last number of decades have devised a number of innovative tools that allow them to understand the dynamics of snow leopard populations. Beginning with Rodney Jackson in central Nepal in the 1980s, Rodney was the first to radio collar and track a number of snow leopards over a number of years. That has progressed in more recent years to using camera traps, which when set up over a grid, help us get a sample of a population, which is then used to extrapolate upwards to estimate snow leopard abundance in a given area across a country or even across the entire range of snow leopards. In more recent years still, the science of genetic analysis has allowed, via the collection of snow leopard scat, 
or poo, different genetic markers for individual snow leopards to be isolated, again giving a picture of the number of snow leopards in a given area, helping us to quantify their population. And in the last year, the Snow Leopard Conservancy has piloted, or actually remote piloted, the use of drones to count snow leopard prey, wild sheep and goats, in Central Asia. What all of these innovative natural science tools are doing is helping giving snow leopard conservationists a fighting chance of finding snow leopards across the vastness of Central Asia. In practice, what they're doing is allowing us to find the needles in the haystack. And in doing so, they form the bedrock of snow leopard conservation, understanding and quantifying the populations of snow leopards, of their prey species, and of their habitat. Those are the key metrics of snow leopard conservation. And while many of the threats and solutions for snow leopard survival in the wild come in fact from human beings, and we'll look more at that in the next section, understanding the numbers of snow leopards, where they are, their movements, those are the key basis for ensuring their survival in the wild. In that sense, whether predator or prey or habitat, the science of snow leopards is the science of conservation. When I did my PhD fieldwork on snow leopard conservation in the Annapurna and Everest regions of Nepal, I had to pack up and carry all of my gear in this very rucksack. And here's some of the things that I packed up in my bag. But it wasn't a case of bringing camera traps, radio collars, drones, or scat collection bags, because I'm a social scientist, and so I had very different kit with me to help me do my research. I had, among other things, a smartphone with voice recorder so that we could interview people and record those for transcribing later on. We had lots and lots of folders because we wanted paper backup copies of everything. We had hundreds and hundreds of questionnaires, having talked to 700 locals and 400 tourists about snow leopards, snow leopard conservation, and some of the challenges and opportunities bound up in those activities. And of course, as we, we needed computers, not just to log uh, all our data and to back it up digitally, but also because we were blogging from the field, sharing our stories about what we were doing with people back at home in Ireland and indeed all around the world. In a sense, we need social science when it comes to snow leopard conservation because snow leopards depend on coexisting with people throughout a vast area of their range. And there's no better way to understanding snow leopard conservation and the human dimensions of it than actually getting out in the field and talking to people. In that sense, what you have to do is this. You've got to pack up your science in your old kit bag. There's no substitute for getting out there and talking to people, talking to people about how they feel about snow leopards, about how snow leopards have occasionally killed their livestock, about their veneration perhaps for the snow leopard because of their religious or cultural beliefs. And in terms of working with local communities who are the guardians of snow leopard populations, social science helps gives us the tools to understand them, their concerns, the challenges, but also some of the solutions to working for people and snow leopards to coexist together. Building on the work that I did in the field, the Snow Leopard Conservancy have been running an innovative project funded by the Darwin Initiative of the UK government that works to create snow leopard tourism trails in those two areas of Nepal, at the same time improving the wealth and well-being of local communities, but also improving populations of snow leopards and their prey in the wild. Now, of course, at the moment, with COVID-19 having decimated the tourism industry around the world, that is proving to be a particular problem. And the Conservancy is working very hard to help people diversify their income and provide emergency support so that they are neither fully dependent on livestock or fully dependent on tourism. But it's not just local communities and the grassroots levels that we have to consider coexistence between people and snow leopards. We also need to think about the big picture and the geopolitical level. 
China in particular is crucial for the future of snow leopards in the wild, having about 60% of snow leopard habitat and about 60% of snow leopard populations. And as China develops its western half through the likes of the Silk Belt and Road Initiative and links that western half up to the rest of the world, some of those big infrastructure pro projects could have potential negative impacts on snow leopard habitats and populations. And so we need to look at ways that we can understand and mitigate those projects when they happen. In addition, there are a number of nuclear armed neighbors with large armies on borders in snow leopard country and as snow leopards move freely between habitats. That's another consideration about lots of weapons and off-duty soldiers in snow leopard habitat. So when it comes to coexistence, we have to think about the grassroots and the geopolitical simultaneously. In that sense, the science of snow leopards is really the science of coexistence. Snow leopard landscapes are the water tower of the world. Many of the world's greatest rivers start as glacial meltwater somewhere on a steep hillside in snow leopard country. In South Asia, the Indus, the Sutlej, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra. In Southeast Asia, the Salween, the Irrawaddy and others. In East Asia, the Yellow and the Yangtze. And in North Asia, the Ob, Irtish and the Yenisei, two of the world's greatest rivers that you've probably never heard of, they all start in snow leopard landscapes. In fact, so much water is produced from these rivers and countless others that don't have names that snow leopard habitat provides water for a third of the human race. But downstream, of course, of snow leopard landscapes, it's not just people living, it's people farming and producing food. Downstream of snow leopard landscapes is the rice basket of the world. Huge amounts of production of rice, consumption of rice, much of it rain fed by the monsoon, but some of it, especially where there's irrigation schemes, some of that water coming from those rivers that start in snow leopard landscapes. Snow leopard landscapes aren't just the water tower of the world, the rice basket of the world downstream of them, but they also power the factories of the world, from clothes to electric car batteries, many of the consumer goods, perhaps even the components in the screen that you're watching this on, were made in a factory somewhere in Asia and powered by water that originally started in a river in snow leopard country. The technical term for this is a provisioning ecosystem service. It's all of the things that nature does for us that allow us to sustain life on this planet. But it's not just the practical needs that ecosystem services provide for. They also meet intangible needs in us as human beings as well. When I first flew into Kathmandu from Delhi on my first trip to the Himalayas, I could see this double cloud bank on the horizon until I looked again and I saw that the clouds were the lower level and the clouds above the clouds were mountains. The great and mighty Himalayas, the abode of snows, had been raised on a diet of stories about big cats and big mountains and I was filled with a sense of awe and wonder at these phenomenal landscapes that I was now able to see and walk amongst for the very first time. In that sense we're getting beyond the tools of natural science and even the tools of social science we're getting into the realm of myth and legend and so as well as scientific tools we need arts and humanities to help us qualify what snow leopard landscapes do for human beings. Whether that's local people who live alongside snow leopards and venerate them sometimes as a deity or venerate the landscape as sacred, or whether it's people on the other side of the world who are amazed by this phenomenal place in Central Asia, this water tower of the world, alongside the evidence for snow leopard conservation. We need the emotion alongside 
the facts, we need the feelings. Alongside the science, we need the stories. Therefore, whether it's water or wonder, the science of snow leopard landscapes is also the story of snow leopard landscapes. When I was eight or nine years old, I encountered my first real snow leopard on a family outing to Dublin Zoo. I was instantly smitten with the species and over two decades later, I'm still smitten with snow leopards and their habitat. And it's a story, my exploration of the science of snow leopards that has taken me from seeing my first snow leopard in Dublin Zoo to working with snow leopards in captivity through to doing a PhD in snow leopard conservation in Nepal and onwards to assisting the work of the Snow Leopard Conservancy as an associate. If you're interested in finding out more about my fieldwork, some of the stories, some of the findings and some of the photos, you can go to my fieldwork blog at snowleopardresearchnepal.wordpress.com. If you're interested in finding out more about snow leopards generally and in particular about the pioneering work of the Snow Leopard Conservancy in a number of different Central Asian countries, you can go to their website at snowleopardconservancy.org. Our story about the science of snow leopards tonight has taken us on a journey across the world and it's been a journey in four different stages as we've looked at four different components of the science of the mountain ghost, the science of snow leopards. We first looked at the science of snow leopards themselves and how the species is superbly adapted and perfectly attuned to its harsh mountain environment in Central Asia. Secondly, we looked at the science of snow leopard conservation and how scientists use different natural science tools to understand and quantify snow leopard populations and the populations of their prey and their habitat, providing that baseline against which snow leopard conservation success or failure can be measured. We then looked at the issue of the science of snow leopard coexistence and particularly the importance of social science in understanding people because living alongside people be it at the grassroots or the geopolitical level is absolutely essential for the survival of snow leopards in the wild both in terms of understanding the threats that people pose but also the solutions that we can all work together towards. And lastly we looked at the science of snow leopard landscapes and how this vast area of Central Asia with snow leopards as its keystone predator provides valuable ecosystem services for local communities and for all of us right around the world, providing water for a third of the human race and wonder for three thirds. All told, our story has shown us not just that snow leopard conservationists like me are connected to snow leopards or local communities who live alongside snow leopards are connected to them, but that all of us are connected to snow leopards intimately, intricately and inextricably. And that's because in our interconnected world with, on one hand, it's interconnected challenges and on the other hand, it's interconnected solutions. What I find and what I hope you've discovered tonight is that the science of snow leopards is really the science of us all. <laughs>